Good day, everyone. Uh, it's Dr. K coming at you from London, and Gil Morales coming at you from Playa del Rey. Uh, the markets have gotten tagged, as we can see, over the last couple of days with a, a slew of negative news, um, of course, including the Fed comments, the housing weak housing starts, and then the Eurozone um, recession that looks like it's going to be prolonged. So all of those at triumvirate have certainly taken the market down a few pegs, as well as some leading stocks. Um, we need to be careful, however, because uh, if you look at that um, chart, the QE chart that goes all the way back to 2009 um, that I included, um, the chart um, essentially shows when you have QE1 or QE2, you have a market that is generally in an uptrend. Now, it will have its setbacks. Some of those setbacks were motivated by the Fed talk that uh, they might want to lighten up on QE or end QE. Um, and what would happen is the markets would pull back and then bounce and, and resume the uptrend. Um, also, negative news out of Europe, uh, recessionary news uh, when the Bank of England, uh, the, the, when it was declared that the UK is officially in recession several months ago. Obviously, these are things that can take the market slower, but the US market would get right back on its feet and move higher. Um, the, the situation we're in right now, um, we have negative Fed comments in regards to QE, and we have uh, negative recessionary news out of Europe. And they all they both happen at the same time. But my question is, um, is that enough to derail the overall uptrend that we've been seeing? We're at pure QE, QE3 right now, which is more powerful than Operation Twist. If, if you all remember from that, um, that graph I sent you, Operation Twist is not as powerful a mechanism as pure QE. And the markets reflected that in a more luck last luck last look, lackluster, I should say, <laughs> lackluster um, uptrend during Operation Twist. But now that we're in QE3 mode, the, the question is if the market is going to continue its uptrend. Um, if history is any guide, it probably will after, after the setback we're seeing. Um, again, leading stocks are a, a clue. However, uh, we all might remember um, times when the markets did pull back and leading stocks got hit very hard and uh, yet the markets were able to stabilize and move higher um, if basically on QE fumes where um, a lot of junky stocks in some cases were, were, were the ones that were uh, leading the markets and so it's it's a tricky time we're in right now because we are seeing leaders get hit the, mo the model is getting closer to going to cash if not an outright sell but we also don't want to get into a situation like um, it was May to July of 2010 where the market would move just slow enough to trigger a sell signal and then and then the market would stabilize and bounce and move higher and that happened uh, in, in repeatedly through those months so the model is aware of that we are in a pure QE mode and um, and and that is uh, countering the negative news so we're gonna have to see ultimately though how price volume plays out the model obviously will switch out of its buy signal should conditions uh, worsen um, enough such that warrants a sell signal or a cash signal. Uh, Gil? Uh, yeah, I have a question for you. If, if we're in Q pure QE and it's the most powerful form of QE, then what's, why is gold just getting hammered? To me, this seems to be telling you something about the traction that QE might have, it, at least in the economy. I mean, we saw the Fed, Philly Fed index today, minus 12.5 versus expectations of a positive 1.5. And meanwhile, you've got gold and silver just getting raked. And so my question is, if uh, to you is, is if if QE is so powerful here, what what gives here? What what is uh, what is this all about? What do you think? Yeah, I mean that's that obviously is a counter um, counter trend going on with uh, with the precious metals. Um, the, the dollar's been stronger, the euro's been weaker, and of course, stronger dollar um, means essentially a um, a weaker pre precious met metal stance. And we also have China that is uh, very positive on the dollar. Um, that is the, the tallest standing midget, and so they're exerting influence. They also China also likes the idea that gold would be cheaper because it is buying gold as a net net purchaser of gold, um, as they want to unwind their treasury, their U.S. treasuries. So I, I think you have some cross currents going on that are bullish and bearish um, for precious metals. Um, and that said, the, the the metals are getting hit harder than than they have in, in quite a while. I mean, you'd have to go back to 2011 um, yeah. to see when the, you know, the, the metals were putting in a, a, the low of their base, and we're seeing that now. So um, certainly, you know, the, all these cross-currents are, are, you know, make the situation a bit 
fuzzy in terms of you know any definitive trend that should occur, whether up or down. Um, and if, for instance, if gold were to find its low here, it start basing again, um, I wouldn't be particularly surprised. On the other hand, if it starts establishing a downtrend um, and breaks down through the, through the its current lows, then that would be um, that would really be a first. And so I'm watching for those critical uh, support levels, really right around uh, 148 and a half on GLD. If it were to break below that, and it's not far from that, um, then then certain something that that get clues in that something material perhaps is changing, um, and that we need to be aware of it. And that QE, therefore QE3, maybe is not <clears throat> is not living up to uh, prior uh, QE1 and QE2 in terms of its right. power propelling the markets higher. Yeah, I mean the gold, gold, I think silver and gold both uh, are coming down to support levels. So you can actually see here's the one, well, almost a two-year chart, say one and a half-year chart of the gold futures, and you can see you're getting some pretty good volume today uh, as you come up off of support. So somebody's using this as an opportunity to step in into gold, and I would think that you'll you'll see it find support somewhere in here, but it could also undercut these lows, so we're just keeping an eye on But it is puzzling to me, and, and I thought one of the clues, and, and basically yesterday I went to cash. I mean, my stocks were looking pretty good uh, yesterday morning, but you could see the housing sector start to break down, and in my view, uh, you know, this is an area, the, the home building sector has been touted as uh, the area of, of strength in the economy, and, and yes, of course, is the home building stocks have Trended higher, but you've had two day, two months of uh, negative uh, housing starts. And my view is that the banks are keeping foreclosures off the market because they don't want to be in a position where they have to uh, price them according to the market, but rather mark them to myth uh, on their balance sheet. So they're they're holding back all the supply, and this has opened up a window for home builders to address existing demand uh, by building more homes. And I think that's what you've been seeing off the lows, and it has. Uh, the banks have been successful in driving probably a, a double bubble here in housing, possibly. But you're seeing all the stocks break down. So my view is that you start to see these things break down, and that may be one of the underpinnings of this market that's now being unpinned. And I thought it was a good time to bag some profits and uh, step to the sidelines, even going short. So you, know, you saw a bunch of these slicing through the 50-day, Lennar slicing through the 50-day. Now notice that these stocks, a lot of them did this back in November. But they were able to recover. Uh, if they break down and this, and they don't recover, then I think that's another clue and possibly another nail in the market's coffin. If we're going to come off some more, so you know, looking pretty grim. A lot like Coors, looking pretty grim. Um, now closing below the, or below the 6090 level that we we're using for a stop on the position. And uh, next one is 5990. I think you just cruised just below that. Um, you know, I was a little bit uh, upset, and probably that's not a good word to use, but I just kind of miffed that the management, of course, goes and uh, announces another secondary as the stock looks like it just wants to go higher. And you might think that uh, they would they would allow the stock to do that, but they go and dump 25 million shares into it. Uh, my position yesterday was actually to to blow out of my long and go short the stock, and then I just covered uh, this morning, getting about two or three points off of it, so it's just kind of a quick tactical short, you know, uh, so short term, but it was actually good for a nice move, and uh, made up for what was given up on this gap down yesterday. But that, that's looking pretty grim. You got a take on cores, Dr. K? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the third time it's announced a secondary. Um, it undercut the lows of the gap up day. Um, it's you know, it, it's not as uh, Sanguine as you'd like to see, um, I think some investors are getting a bit skeptical because of the uh, continuous round of secondaries, um, and uh, maybe it gives the appearance that uh, the insiders are looking to um, sell, you know, unload more and more of the stock. Um, and that said, you know, if you were if you bought this on the on the viable gap up, um, it undercut uh, by, you know, more than two percent. It looks like more than two percent porosity. So. Um, I would not be sitting in this position at, the, at this time. You can reinstate it certainly uh, if uh, you know it sets up again. It, if it's viable, it'll set up again and go. But we, if you look at prior times um, with cores, it, it tends to not really go. You, you get these uh, periods like um, on uh, September 21st, where you have a, a viable gap of situation and a pocket pivot, 
in one, and uh, and then it just flatlines. So um, it's a tricky stock, and the, the insiders are not making it easy on us. Yeah, and I think it's really unfortunate because if you look at Michael Kors numbers, you know everything about it is stellar. Uh, ASMR rating, I think a 97 composite rating, relative strength EPS, uh, accelerating earnings, accelerating uh, sales, uh, high return on equity, I and mean, it's got everything you would be looking for. And, and it seems like management just goes and dumps uh, shares onto the market. And I, I would like to know why they are so eager to cash out. But they priced that thing yesterday uh, rather quickly after hours at 61.50. And of course, that extra supply is showing up. Stocks trading at 60.06 uh, this morning and just gapping down again. So looking pretty grim. Uh, one stock though that we've liked and has, act, has acted okay actually, you know, this is a very sharp move up so it's entitled to a pullback, comes right down just above the 10, uh, 10 day moving average. But I think this thing probably needs, if it's going to go higher and, and let's say the market does stabilize and, and it's going to go higher, I think you're looking at another formation here, maybe a three weeks tight formation, something like that, a tight flag and then we would expect to see some sort of uh, pocket pivot hopefully if it's going to continue. Uh, to go higher, but this is a leader, and even if the market goes into correction, it stays on my watch list at the very least. Um, see the market's coming off again. We did have a sharp rally off the lows, but I thought that made sense, given that you are, if we go to the NASDAQ chart here, you are coming down to the February low here, where you jacked down right at the beginning of the of the month. Now, as I see this, Dr. K, this is a little bit different. Last time, okay, you, you had the market come off for one day pretty hard. The volume was lighter, however. And a lot of leading stocks held up okay. And this time around, what, what struck me about yesterday's selling is that it seemed to encompass a broad swath of leading stocks. And a lot of them got whacked pretty good off the peak. Of course, you know, the home builders being one example of a sector uh, leading the market that's now kind of come apart. And maybe the whole housing uh, uh, dope of hope there is, is kind of off the table now. And uh, But you're seeing other stocks getting smacked around and not looking to... Uh, too pretty here. Yeah, well, it reminds me. strikes me as much different. You had heavy volume yesterday too on the break. Yeah, I mean, you had um, in July of last year, you had uh, some uh, heavier volume days, distribution days. Market went straight down for four days, and then it went straight down again for four days after bouncing. And and I remember the leaders got tagged yeah, pretty but you hard. Yeah, you weren't coming. You weren't coming off a peak in July. In July last year, you were trying to rally off the lows, so you had this coming straight down. But that's not off the peak up here. Once the market started to break down off the peak, it it pretty much trended lower. So this, to me, this looks even more different than. Uh, yeah, I mean last year. So right, I, I just remember um, off the peak though in 2009. Um, well, yeah, 2009 and even 2010, there were there were. Periods where you know things got hit pretty hard, and I remember it was very easy to just go to cash. Um, and then, of course, we all know what happened in 2009. The markets were pretty relentless, going higher. But then right. that was QE1, and you know, the, certainly an argument, as, especially depending on what happens with precious metals. And uh, a mar argument could be made that this QE3 is it just doesn't have the power that uh, the prior uh, forms of QE did. Yeah. yeah. So. So anyways, um, you know, we've taken our steps to uh, protect ourselves, lock in profits, uh, move to cash uh, in a lot of cases. And a lot of these stocks that we have got whacked pretty good. So I thought yesterday was a good opportunity uh, to back off and see where things go. And you are you're pretty extended here. So, you know, for the market to pull back, does it come off 3 to 5 percent? Maybe that's all. But I think if you do come off 3, for three to 5 percent, a lot of these leading stocks come off a lot more. And the one, one thing I've noticed about playing the long side of these markets back from 2009 is, is that you don't get a lot of stocks that have these sustained moves that tend to be very choppy. And it's easy to get shaken out if you're late uh, selling. I'd rather be in the position of being out of the market wishing I were in rather than in the market wishing I were out that right now. That's kind of how I feel about it. So I don't know how all you guys feel about it out there. But, um, you know, it's not fun watching stocks like Coors get whacked and... Uh, even these other ones, you know, Triple D, 3D Systems is now breaking the 50-day moving average. Remember uh, Regeneron, the stock that we loved? And that thing never went anywhere. Uh, tried to come out a couple times, and now it's just come apart. So you're seeing a lot of these things just kind of looking ugly. Meanwhile, Google, everybody still loves Google, and it's, well, it's trying to rally this morning, but it looks like it's giving it up. It's still up a little bit. 
Um, let's see, why don't we uh, go through some questions here. So you kind of know where we stand, very cautious on the markets. So we'll see if the MVM market direction model goes to a sell signal. I do think you have to handle your stocks on a stock-by-stock -stock basis and protect yourself. You know, like I said, I'd rather be out of this market wishing I were in than in this market wishing I were out. And I think that's kind of where, where I stand right now. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, Dr. K, someone's asking about the, uh, whoops, let's go, go to a daily chart here, the UVXY, what, what's up with that? Um, I, I, I should probably disclose, I went long the UVXY yesterday at $8.82, uh, I got a little buy signal there, but I'll get buy signals on a daily basis and they may not pan out, yesterday's panned out really well, uh, so if I can come in and, and take an intraday buy signal using my little 620 uh, intraday chart on it, I, I will, and yesterday's turned out pretty well, um, and it's still moving up. So what's going on, uh, Dr. K, with the... Yeah, you know, uh, of course, you all know that the uh, UVXY model is not a day trading model. It's designed to catch right. the major trends, so of course you can trade around it. Um, if you catch um, the 620, yeah. uh, it's very good at, uh, you know, the intraday aspects. Um, and so, in other words, with 620, you're not looking for a trend. Uh, I mean, a long-term trend. You're looking for intraday trends. And since UVXY and VXX, all those instruments are quite volatile. Um, if you're doing an intraday trade uh, using some kind of strategy you've devised, um, you could be powerfully profitable, especially on a day like yesterday. Um, but in the meantime, the UVXY remains on a sell. Uh, the MDM remains on a buy. But like I said, both of these models are closer to either moving to cash or re reversing altogether. Um, I would say UVXY is actually more is it's closer to going to a neutral rather than a buy signal. It generally, will not it, on rare occasions will it go to a buy signal because the um, these instruments tend to have a downward bias. Um, if you look at UVXY or VXX, you can see uh, visually that that only on rare occasions do these actually spike to the upside, um, where a buy signal would be warranted. And again, the the model is looking to be. On, it tries to be on the more conservative side because these instruments are so volatile. So it rather would go to cash rather than to a buy signal um, in many cases. But we'll see uh, what the market offers us going forward. Yeah, and, and you know, this UVXY, I've traded it, and I just felt, you know, if we're going to talk about this, I should disclose that I am long the thing. So, uh, but, but what I've noticed is it's also kind of cheesy because look at the VIX today. You're up 4.9% on the VIX. The UVXY is up 4.75, and it's supposed to achieve two times the VIX's movement. Yesterday, the VIX was up over 19%. The UVXY was up over no, there's, there's, 15%. Um, so what's up with that, Dr. So there's, it's, there's, it's, it's, it's always, always Who do I compare to? I've said this um, a number of times. A VIX does not correlate with the UVXY or the VXX. Yeah. But only loosely does it. So if someone's looking to, if they, someone thinks the VIX is going to go higher, um, then, yeah, odds are that the, that there will be some correlation, but not necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, there's often decoupling that goes on, maybe even for two days, um, and the model recognizes that. That's why the model the model looks at the the VIX, but only in context. It's not looking for absolute values when it comes to VIX. Okay, I think I'm gonna boycott it when I sell this thing and hopefully take a profit on it. I'm going to boycott it. Maybe I'll just trade the VXX. It uses up twice your buying power, I think. Well, the VXX and the UVXY. VXX is 1x, UVXY is 2x, and those are used, those correlate quite well. So, for instance, right now VXX is up 2.8%, and the UVXY is up about 5%, 5.14%. You know, it's it's going to be two to one roughly, um, and you can you can see that um, in a long-term chart of these instruments. But yeah. I would not, I would never use the VIX on an absolute level because then you'll get yes. in trouble. Very good. Okay. Uh, anyways, let's see. Um, you know what? I thought I should probably go over just just so you guys have them in your back pockets. Some uh, short sale ideas. You know, one of one of my favorites here is this Align Technology. Uh, if you look at it, let's pull. Up, we're going to put these side by side so you can see what's going on here in terms of the weekly and the daily chart. But this stock has had a pretty decent upside move and. Uh, Building a head and shoulders. There's your classic break off the peak on the weekly chart down here. You're always looking for that in a head and shoulders formation. And now what you're doing is you're gapping down on heavier volume today below the 200-day moving average. So I look at this one as kind of easy, using a 31.44 stop at the high of the day, which is also the 20. Uh, I'm sorry, the 200-day moving average. Uh, looks like it's shortable. Looking for the 50-day as your first downside price target, roughly. So you can get down maybe. Seven eight percent. We'll see if that uh, pans out into anything more. But it is a thinner stock. I'm short the stock already. 
Uh, I thought yesterday it was a uh, good time to get short this thing. I've been watching it, and you, know, you had this gap up move here. I think that was after earnings or something, and it continued to move a little higher. But notice how it did stall up here, and that's pretty classic for a right shoulder. It can't get above the left shoulder here and uh, on this rally, and it finds resistance at a logical area in here. So I think this is a reasonable short sale play if you guys are into that. It is a little bit thinner. It trades just over a million shares. Alexion, we've been watching. Uh, I did trade it. I think I told you guys this last week. I did trade it uh, on a day trading basis, uh, you know, on the bump up to the 50-day on earnings, and then it broke down, undercut this low. So I thought that was a short-term cover point. And it did bounce a little bit, but then it went a little lower. Now you're rallying again. You know, I'm, I'm using this level here as, as a stop on a position here. I think you can test a little bit out here and see if it doesn't force you out. But, you know, going from 87 to 90, that's a little over 3%. I can handle that. Uh, maybe even use the 10-day moving average. Usually when these stocks start to break down from head and shoulders formations, which is what you're seeing in Alexion, again, you see the breakdown on the right side on heavy volume. That's your... That's your right side of your head, and then you have this long rolling shoulder. And uh, usually, when they start to break down, if they're really going to work, they'll follow the 10 day moving average to the downside. At the very least, the 20 day, or you could use the 22 day exponential, whatever you feel like. They're roughly equivalent. Um, but you know, for the most part, uh, I'm looking at 90 as being my upside stop on this if I'm going to test the position here. And I might get stopped out, you know, even using the high of the day at 87.97. If it gets up there, just push out and then seek to put it out higher um, in order to catch the move. But you know, in hindsight, having shorted originally up here and then covered down here, I could have just sat with the position and let it play out and see if it breaks down again. But I generally, in this market, don't trust anything uh, when it starts to move sharply in one direction, especially if you're undercutting a low here, which I think sets up a logical rally. And that's, that's what you're getting now. Uh, and it's counter-trending the market right now. But I think that if this thing bumps up a little more, uh, it becomes shortable right in here up to the 90 level. So just keep an eye on that. Of course, Apple's the one everybody's asking about. Uh, you come down for several days here, and I think it's interesting. This is in spite of uh, David Einhorn, Greenlight Capital. And, you know, I want to point out I love David Einhorn because he's the one, I believe, who came out uh, negative on Green Mountain Coffee uh, a few uh, couple years ago if you guys all recall, off the peak, and we were saying the short, you know, you can go back to October of 2000, what is it, 2011, and you can see the reports, the short sale setups where we said to put this thing out around mid-90s, and of course David Einhorn came in and, and badmouthed the company and blew apart, so, you know, we, we love David Einhorn, but I do think it's interesting that despite uh, him uh, suing Apple, and trying to get them to do something with their cash, uh, you know, the judge the other day said that if it went to trial or if it proceeded, he might have a reasonable chance of prevailing. So, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I have no idea what that's all about. But it seems kind of strange that a uh, shareholder, a single shareholder, can force uh, the company to deploy its cash or to pay its cash back to the shareholders. I don't know how that works, but you can see you've come down now. You're coming and testing these lows here. I think it's six. Uh, I'm sorry, four thirty-five. And, uh, I, you know, Apple's probably a short if the market rolls over. I'd prefer to short into some sort of a news bounce if there was some announcement that caused the stock to rally. That seems to be what does it. You know, when Einhorn was suing the company, I think the first news came out here and it drove it up just above the 20-day moving average. And uh, I would point out if you're using a 22-day exponential moving average instead of a 20-day simple, it actually found resistance right at the 22-day exponential. And I found that to be the case. That's why I shifted to using that. Uh, these days, I don't have that on here. I probably should change it. We'll do that later. But you just watch an apple here. I think if it does break, your next uh, stop is the lows of this base here on the weekly chart, uh, which is around 360, I believe, 363 here and 354. So let's just make it an even 360. Um, and so, you know, that, that's what I would be looking for. Interesting story, I uh, bought my son an iPhone, his first phone. I was kind of had to do it because my daughter got her phone when she was uh, 11 and a half, and my son has been bugging me for it. So we went and got him an iPhone, iPhone 4, because it was free. Uh, and uh, the thing would not hook up to Wi-Fi. It would not hook up to our home Wi-Fi. So I took it back. Yep, it was defective. 
and I gave it to the guy and he exchanged it for another one. But here's what's interesting is he turns around and he says, yeah, we're having a lot of problems with the iPhones and there's like six of them stacked up with paper. I guess they do paperwork to have them sent back to be repaired. And so uh, running into uh, problems with iPhones. So they must be getting uh, lower quality. Who knows? Maybe they have the United Auto Workers working on them now. I don't know. But in any case, uh, you know, Apple's still in play as a potential short and... Uh, Probably, let's see, if you draw, you can draw this neckline here, and you rally it up towards it. If you break through the lows here, you, you can very well be headed uh, headed lower. And it's interesting that despite all this news uh, flurry about Apple and Einhorn making some progress in his lawsuit, at least the way I read it, uh, there is no, uh, no push to the upside in the stock. Let's plow through some more. Uh, Amazon short. Uh, you know what? Uh, I have to admit I shorted Amazon yesterday. Uh, I just thought this rally here it looked a little cheesy and it, of course it reversed and I covered this morning, got down to the 10 day and that's all I'm looking to get out of it, you know, 7, 8 points. Uh, but it's potentially a short here. I think you need to watch it. I'd like to see it, you know, break down decisively through the 50 day moving average but if you were going to short it here I think you would have to do so using you know, today's high probably at 269.48 is your near stop and your, your maximum stop would be yesterday's high. I don't think you're going to see it get back above 270 if it's viable as a short. But I think that that's potentially uh, what you're looking at because you have, look on the weekly chart, you can see this huge break on heavy volume and then you have some stalling action over the last three weeks on the weekly chart. Hopefully you can see that. And so I do think it's a little bit suspicious here. So. I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, you know what? I think I'm just watching this here. I covered this morning. Maybe I'll just short a little bit. Give me one second. Test it out here. Bada bing, bada boom. There we go. We're going to fill that uh, 26605. That's me printing. Okay. So we'll see where that goes. Anyways. Uh, I should point out, I also have uh, a line and, and uh, Alexion short from the push-up this morning. Uh, anyways, okay, so let's go through some other ones here. I was looking at F5. This is another one. I hit this one yesterday and covered this morning. It's coming right down into this area of support, but it looks like it, it could break the 200-day, and if it does, it's tricky, though, because you're on top of this area. It could bounce, but I think if the market breaks, this thing could head lower. Um, this is what the overall pattern looks like, just this rolling mountain range of heads and shoulders. You know, here's the shoulder, head, some shoulder stuff, uh, shoulder, head, shoulders here. So you're in a, a second right shoulder of this formation. And uh, that's not an atypical formation to see in a stock like this. But looks like it's ready to break the 10-week 10, 10 moving average right here, and that may send it down at least down to the the 40 week down here at 97 and change. Uh, let's see, people are asking about Lulu. I'm just going to plow through the questions. Uh, Lulu looks like a short to me here. I think if you short it, you're using 7085 as your stop. So, well, wait a minute, I take that back. I notice here's the 200 day. So you'd be using 6817, uh, the 200 day, as your potential stop. You're down two days. But a, a push right back up into the line here, even where it is now, that's probably viable. You can kind of see this as a big cup with a handle that has failed. And so this is a, a late stage failed base. Uh, this cup here is a, here's a cup, big cup with a handle, maybe a pod, somebody might want to say. Uh, but you get another cup with a handle here. And uh, it failed right here. So on that failure now, you've rallied up into the, to the 10 week moving average of 50 day uh, once here. And now you're breaking back down. So that does become a potential short particularly if the rest of the market comes uh, off. And that has been on my short sale watch list, looking pretty grim, actually. Um, let me make a note of that one also. Okay, what else are we looking at? Cores reminded me of all the junior mining stocks. Every every time the stock gets moving, they do a secondary and kill the move. Cores actually reminded me of Cores because these guys keep on whacking this thing, uh, you know, with a secondary offering every time it goes up. What a bunch of BS that is. Anyways, um, Commvault is holding above the 50-day moving average and, and low, the intraday low of the gap-up day, 
that occurred on January 30th. So it's you're not stopped out on this, but we had a position, and yesterday I just thought, you know, goodbye, give it a big kiss, and sent it on its way. And it's maybe I'd look at buying it off the 50. I think you're going to pull back, but you know, kind of typical. You get a big Bible gap up, and no real power behind it. You know, it's just kind of kind of cheesy, you know. Somebody asking about. Let's go sell gene. Most stocks, you know, I'm sure everything's down. That's failing on the breakout attempt yesterday, and it was a Bible gap. It's failing. So, you know, uh, it, it, that's because the general market's in bad. So most of the longs that people are going to ask us about, they're going to be in, looking pretty grim right here, and I think uh, that's something that uh, it has to be considered within the context of what's going on with the general market. And if you have these stocks, and you should have some sort of trailing stop here. Otherwise, you're using the 50-day down here at 91.55 as your selling guy because it has violated the. It looks like the 10-day a few times, so it's a little sloppy around the 10-day. Uh, but you know that reverses. If I had bought this yesterday on this Bible gap, I'd be gone. Just be gone. I don't need to email people and say what are your thoughts or ask other people how they feel about it. All I know is I bought this thing. I'm in the water right away. Goodbye. Give it a big kiss and send it on its way. As I like to say, well, you don't even have to give it a big kiss. Just pat on the head with work. Uh, Kihu 360, same situation. Uh, stocks in this gigantic, uh, you know, pattern here near the highs where it came public and then immediately tanked. So looking, looking like you know, if, if you if you own this, I guess you're using the 50 day as your ultimate selling guide. But you know, it's trying to move higher and reversing. Got K, you have any take on Kihu? Yeah, I mean, I just I don't like the pattern. I mean, it, it's got that massive um, reversal on huge volume, and yeah. And, the, uh, yeah. and then and then just the, the the base that shapes out isn't. Um, yeah, actually, let me look at it on this other chart. Um, Arfin, may we say? I just I don't like how it's. Uh, you know, it's a Chinese stock. I, I've been biased against these because they more or less haven't really been working out regardless of how good, good the fundamentals look which calls into question how accurate the fundamentals reported are um, so I just stay away and you know that's a big defect in the pattern that reversal day um, so you know this the stock I would have sold it on that reversal day and just no questions asked yeah same here same here you know, yeah. I wouldn't have owned it in the first place though because there's too much risk in this kind of name in this right. environment and we felt the same way about Yandex, and of course they announced earnings and they they blew up. But yeah, I think you have to be careful with those Chinese stocks because even the, there was an article in IBD a few days ago about China resisting uh, using standard accounting methods and, and transparency and whatnot. And uh, you know, I think that's a factor whenever you're buying Chinese stocks, and you have to consider yeah. they're still a communist Yandex government. Yandex is, is a Russian stock, and so that was a good question. You know yeah. how accurate are are they, are they reporting standards? Um, now, I mean, the stock has tracked the RSX fairly well, um, but now obviously this is a very big defect in the pattern. So, um, you know, maybe it'll if it continues to track the RSX and should conditions improve on some of these emerging markets, then you know, as, as we've said, YNDX is a possible is a possible candidate. But um, at this point, not at all. You know, not not with that kind of uh, gap down action. No, not even. So HLSS, you know, all, you're seeing all of these come under pressure. All of the mortgage stocks. I think with the, the housing number yesterday, uh, did put some pressure on these. You can see like NSM, uh, OCN, and we actually had a position in N NSM, and we had a position in OCN. I just blew them out yesterday and, and got out pretty decently uh, because I felt that the uh, housing numbers were probably going to weigh on them, and with the home builders getting whacked, uh, you know, I think the two have kind of been moving together. I just sort of saw it being a high risk area to sit around, and I don't really sit around. I don't like to play Humpty Dumpty sitting on the wall, ready to take a great fall, and I don't want to break into a hundred pieces and so on and so forth. You can go read the nursery rhyme somewhere uh, else. I won't recite the whole thing, but. Uh, you know, it's fine and support at the 50-day on that. HLSS is acting a little better, and it's still trying to hold the 10-day moving average, so nothing terrible there. So you really have to decide for yourself how you're going to handle this. Are you going to try and sit through, uh, you know, some uh, downside and stick to your, your ultimate selling guides, depending on the size position you have, and, and basically handle it that way. So I, I know we get a lot of emails, you know, what are your thoughts on this? What are you, you know, something sells off for a day or two, and you know, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, you know, it's it's coming off for a couple of days, and 
that's about it. Has it hit a selling guide anywhere? Not really. Is the pullback anything abnormal relative to other pullbacks it's had? Not really. But it all depends on you know whether you want to sit with it and try and play it out if it's going to recover and go higher. But for my money, you know, based on what happened yesterday, it's better to go away. And like I said, I'd rather be out of the market wishing I were in than in the market wishing I were out. TDC, what is that? Teradata? Is it shortable here? Um, I don't know. You got this gap down here. It's looking like a big head and shoulders. So if you're going to short it, you know, I, I always wonder if people are asking me, is it going straight down from here? I don't know. All I know is if you were going to short it objectively, then you would like to short it as close to the 50-day moving average as possible. You know, you're already in a head and shoulders formation here. So you get this gap down. Chances are it's it's weak enough to head lower. So if you want to short it here today, then you better be ready to sit through a potential rally back up to 63, 64 and potentially get stopped out. That looks to me like a pretty decent move there if that happened, about 5%. So that would be enough to stop me out. So I think uh, on that basis, you want to be uh, you know, careful how you handle these. But I can't tell you if it's going it's shortable right here. Um, Given the current market environment, is it advisable to use inverse ETFs to short the market? Well, I, um, I don't know. Did, did, I'm wondering, does this person go, have you been to our website? We, we advocate using inverse ETFs when the market direction model gives a sell signal. So uh, obviously, of course, uh, if you're going to try and short the market, you believe it's going lower. We think inverse ETFs are just fine to use. Anyways, PRLB. Proto Labs. Um, this is one I was testing out last week, buying a little in here. You got a nice bump, but the volume was not sufficient or strong enough, in my view, yesterday. And I thought, take advantage of that bump and unload it, given the way the market was acting. And it's coming down to the 10 day. It has now violated the intraday low of this uh, get Bible gap up day, which was 46.70. And it has done it by about 2%. So for my money, you know, you're at the very least here, you're gone. You don't know this. Uh, you agree, Dr. K? Yep, pretty much. All uh, that's that all sounds uh, sounds reasonable to me. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. Uh, let's see. Google may now uh, be the um, someone um, MX and uh, uh, what was that other one? Oh yeah, MX. I, I don't know. Thin, you know, I'm not into this. I don't buy it. I'm not going to buy it. Magnet chip. You know, look what it's doing now. So we didn't mention this as a. a Pocket pivot or anything? Did we, Dr. K? I'm just checking right now. Um, I don't think so. I don't believe we. Um, we put, no, we didn't, because uh, it wouldn't. It would have just been too risky, and yeah, it's just 500 million market cap stocks. So yeah, it's a tiny thing. little stock, and you know we don't mess with these. So you know, if you're asking us about it now, well, this question was yesterday. My view is, uh, you know, we would have said today, even if it was still holding, and not something we'd really go for. And I think today's action shows why. Also, when when the stock does seem to break out, it then quickly violates the 50-day. So you know that's another big error of the pattern. You don't want to be dealing with stocks that have that much volatility. Um, and that there there was a follow-up question, uh, I think, by the same person on AL Air Lease Corporation, AL. And the, the problem with this one is that it's never really made made a concerted move. I mean, one of the oldest rules is you want to see see a stock at least double in price before. Before you're going to get interested, uh, applies to to stocks that are not IPOs that have been trading for it, you know, at least a year, and, and this one's been going for about two years now, and it's it really never made a move. I mean, the the earnings line, the fundamentals look quite good on this stock, but I still want to see more um, more price confirmation in the pattern before I get excited about this stock. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a reasonable question because the fundamentals do look really good. The industry group strength is uh, ranked ten, and uh, you know you the the uh, institutional sponsor. Well, no, institutional sponsorship's just been flatlining. So, um, but anyway, overall, I'd like to see more powerful price action in the stock, and then maybe get interested. Yeah, and it, you know, you're you're in this big ugly formation. You're just coming up to the peak here, so I don't really see this as something I want to own, especially in this environment. Somebody's asking, would appreciate your suggestions on inverse ETFs to work at this time. Well, since the market direction model is still on a buy signal. There really aren't any uh, such ETFs that we would be uh, advising you to work at this time. Dr. K, you have any comments on that? Again, if you want to do, I mean, if some people have very short time frames. If, if, you, if you have an intermediate term time frame that you're using the MDM with, but you want to trade around the MDM signal based on very short term time frames, 
like a swing trade or a day trade, um, you know, that's that's certainly viable. I mean, if you have a good strategy, why not use it? But we don't advise um, those types of short-term strategies because they're not really uh, practicable, um, you know, do, using real time and to advise people, okay, trade now. You have to trade now, you know, to almost right. to the second. And, yeah, it's, it's not a... Uh, it's not realistic uh, given given uh, the layout of what we do. So it's really beyond the scope of this website to provide that kind of direction. Now, here's another question. Uh, what are your suggestions? If we get an MDM sell signal, what are your suggestions for uh, ETFs? I think, though, if you did have an MDM sell signal, you would list in the email itself, in the alert, uh, exactly what ETFs. My, I would guess that the NASDAQ has been... NASDAQ 100 has been pretty weak, and so that's one. Uh, what is it? TZA is the inverse uh, Russell, so that that seems to come off. What's your take on that? What do you What do yeah, you think I mean, if you get a sell signal? On a sell signal, uh, if generally speaking, small caps tend to be more volatile, so the TZA is is possible. However, um, if the signal's false and the market gets going again, it, it's I would not be surprised to see the Russell 2000 continue to lead the market, and therefore that TZA will be will be a quite. Um, it, it, you'll lose more on TZA than say a 3x um, Nasdaq ETF like SQQQ, uh, simply because it, the the Russell 2000 is going to be more volatile in either direction than than the Nasdaq 100. Um, I like the Nasdaq 100. I like uh, in terms of a sell signal. I think uh, that would probably be my first choice. Um, would be you know any of the any of the inverse uh, Nasdaq 100 uh, ETFs mm -hmm. at this point where I well, from where things look right now. Of course, this could change in a few days with changing conditions. But right now, I, I think I favor the Nasdaq 100 going short that index. Yeah. Uh, DGI, I don't you know like I said, I don't care for anything long. So we had some of this, and I just unloaded it yesterday. It looked like it was getting some support. Off of the 50 or the 10 10 week uh, moving average last week, you can see that here on the weekly chart. But you're now reversing and breaking to the downside. I, I'm just not going to sit. It's just uh, you know give it a big kiss and send it on its way. I don't want to own any stocks right now. So you, may, you know maybe Dr. K has some stocks he wants to own, but I don't think so. Um, DKS is it a short? Well, if if you think this is a big head and shoulders, sure this would be the spot to be hitting it, and you're using you know the the 200-day moving average, the red line here is your stop, so it's pretty tight. So yeah, you could try it. Um, somebody's asking, how do you plan to trade it? I'm not going to go into any detail on how I'm trading the UVXY uh, because I don't, I don't need you guys jumping in and getting your head handed to you because you don't really know what you're doing. So I'm not even going to get into discussing it. For those of you who've seen how we used the 620 uh, intraday model. Uh, you know, I've talked about using that, and that's basically my guy. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to unload it. If I got in it on at 882 on this puppy, and I'm looking at uh, you know two bucks of upside, 20 over 20 percent move in the stock, I'm trying to hang out a little bit here and see see how this pans out. You know, if the market starts to show some support and moves higher, then yeah, maybe I'm uh, I'm gone. I'll take my profit. But uh, you know, it's going to depend on a lot of factors and. Uh, I think for someone to try to do it, if you haven't been observing this and studying it for a while, um, don't even bother. IBD calling Mellon out a possible short. Um, well, wh what I want to know is where were they up? You know, when we were talking about it up here, this is really where you have your your ugly formation. And so, you know, it's possibly a short here. You're running into the 50-day moving average. Usually, stocks that are shortable for the second time uh, offer a a spot right at the 10 week moving average. So, so you're getting in here. I haven't been able to borrow this stock, so unfortunately I wanted to short it up here and was never able to borrow the stock, as those of you who follow us on these webinars know way back then. Uh, but, you know, that's where you would give it a shot, I suppose. So. Somebody says uh, volume on, on 124 looks like support. Well, right here on the weekly chart. And right here, but that was after the you know the earnings report. Everybody's short the thing, and, and it's come down for a ways. I mean, it might work. It's possible. It's not something I would go after right here myself, but it doesn't mean anything either. 
Positives earnings from TRN. Is this a good time to buy? Uh, no, it's way up there. Why is it a good time to buy? You know, we we operate on the basis of price volume rules. Not that they had a good earnings report. Now this is a good time to buy. You sound like you should be talking to a retail broker when you ask that sort of question. To be honest, um, because you have to understand the rules for buying stocks. If something isn't just a good time to buy just because they had a good earnings report. I mean, that's about as as silly as you could possibly be. In my view, uh, the stock is extended, and uh, you don't. There's no buy point here, so you're not going to buy it here no matter what. So, anyways, NXPI. I don't care for anything on the long side, so I already know I don't like this coming down for a couple of days. So you know, I don't know what to tell you. What's your selling guide? End the story. TMW. What's TMW? Oh, Dow Jones total market ETF. Comment on it. I don't know what there. What is there to comment on? It's a thin ETF. I probably wouldn't mess with it. A uh, little, little funky there. Now that Triple D and SSYF have broken the 50-day, could you short any vol low volume rise to the 50-day moving average? I think that's a good question, but I don't think so because you're you're too, it's too soon in the pattern. You can't really tell how this is breaking down. Um, so I think it needs a little more time, but it is starting to show some breakdowns. I tell you, I've, I've, in the past, I can remember shorting this sort of pattern and thinking that you know this thing's going to break, it's going to break, and then it turns around and jacks one time, blows you out, stops you out, and uh, you know, end the story. So I think, uh, yeah, maybe, but you have to. We have to see how this pans out. So we'll be following it. Baidu is short. I think Baidu is going lower. So yeah. But you're in a position where you come down three days, so rally. I'd love to see a rally back up to the mid 90s and short it there. But you look at this on a long-term chart; it's got a seven relative strength. Uh, you know, you're testing this low, so you've come down pretty sharply over the last three weeks. So you're a little late to the party if you're trying to short it here. Doesn't mean it can't go lower, but I don't know if I would short it here necessarily. I, I prefer stocks in other uh, more better positions. CTRX is this that catamaran? That, that we love to hate or hate to love, something uh, like yeah, that. Yeah, sloppy. It's sloppy. Uh, it's too sloppy. Yeah, and we don't want to mess with it. Somebody says, I, I hate this market. I think we need a 20 to 30 percent correction to reset the market. Yeah, I, I think you need something because I don't understand why the economy is going to recover given all the weight that's been thrown on top of it. I think you're just looking at a QE rally in the market. And what happens is as the market rallies, institutional money managers are, are forced to come into the market. They have no choice. They have to keep up with their bogey, the S&P 500 or whatever their bogey is and what they're tracked against. Uh, and, and they have to come in. And I think you get, you, as you move higher, you force a lot of people in and QE pushes the market higher and, and nobody's really selling. So I think that's, uh, that's what happens. And so maybe we do, you know, it'd be nice if we had a nice correction because we make a lot of money on the downside. Jack is jacking Jack in the box, so I'm not a buyer. So you know, if you like Jack in the box, I think they have great commercials. Uh, but you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to buy it. Sloppy pattern. I see, yeah, see I'm not going to buy it. What's that, Dr. K? Sloppy pattern. Stay away from it. If you look at the uh, weekly, I mean, this is about as sloppy and trend, you know, trendless as it gets. So I wouldn't, wouldn't touch this one. Yeah, PCYC. I mean, this thing came out, you know, here on the breakout, so it's up there. So, you know, what do you do if if you have a selling guide somewhere, if it starts to get in trouble or whatnot, then I guess you sell it. But I don't, you know, it's up there, so it's extended, so and it's a position to pull back. So I, I don't, I can't tell you anything outside of that. AMWD. Uh, my view is I I don't touch these stocks. Trades 120,000 shares a day. That's like, you know, one broker getting on the phone can call up. A few of his clients that get this thing jack into the upside, and when I was a broker, and you guys used to love to do that, you know, find a stock trading seventy thousand shares a day and get on the, get on the phone and and jack it up. But I think this sort of movement is typical for an ultra ultra thin stock. And my view is on these sorts of thin stocks, if you start getting some sharp upside like this, uh, I tend to be selling into it because when uh, these thin stocks are moving up and the ducks are quacking. You definitely have to feed the ducks. If you want to become one of the ducks trying to buy into this move at the peak, then you're going to get smacked, and that's my view. So, Dr. K, I know you like this one, and uh, what's your take? AMWD, yeah, this one, um, you know, the fundamentals, uh, you know, the industry group, the acceleration in earnings and sales, 
uh, it's checking all the boxes, you know, institutional sponsorship keeps climbing. Um, it's been doing everything quite right. Uh, the pattern, it, it does obey the 50 day for, uh, you know, several months. You know, then you've got the pocket pivot. It's very easy to buy into that. And, and by the way, if you had bought the pocket pivot, you'd still, you'd still be up on the stock. But right. of course, you know, we advocate when you have a gap down like you saw this morning, don't ask questions. Just sell it at the open. Just dump it. Because look what happens. It goes all the way down um, almost to the 50 day. And so, you know, you just, my general rule is stock gaps down, I'm out at the open. Yeah, I also think that, you know, if, if we have a, uh, you know, subscribers into the thousands and uh, we put out an alert on something like this and it trades 107,000 shares a day, close to 100, I think it was 108,000 was the volume at the time. If for all you know, you, you got a bunch of our subscribers running into the stock, you know. So I would be very wary of any stock that trades that little volume and it starts moving sharply. So think about this next time, guys. Is that when the ducks are quacking on these really thin things, you want to feed the ducks to generally because if they start to break down, you're not going to have a fun time getting out. You can see that uh, this morning you could have just been shaken out at the very lows and you know it, it goes back up another six, seven, eight percent. So very difficult to trade. Uh, really thin stocks like that. So I just avoid them. That's why I have a minimum volume requirement. Somebody wants to know if they short CF. Um, well, you should have done that a couple days ago. So it's breaking down. Now the pattern is in breakdown mode. You have an improper double bottom and that fails. And now you're, you're trying to see how this rallies, if it does rally, and how you're going to handle uh, that if you want to short it. But it's starting to break down. I don't see any short point here. It's at the tuner day. Someone's asking me, is it too late to, sh to buy the UVXY for a day trade? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of a bizarre question. You know, is it too I don't know. If it goes higher, it isn't. If it, goes, if it turns around and goes slower, it is. But, you know, you've you got to think about these things in advance and have a method for coming in, not somebody telling you, yes, it's okay to buy this intraday for a day trade. You know, that's, that's, that's just the wrong way to think. Yeah, it's a, think it's a dangerous question because UVXY, well, it's a dangerous question in general because you want advice, and, uh, and, then, and then who's going to tell you to get out of the position and when the time is right? right. I mean, so, it's very, and UVXY is, is the most volatile instrument out there, so um, you've got to have a method to your, to your madness that, that is statistically sound, that, that doesn't just prove in back tests over, you know, cycles, or at least, you know, long enough that you can say statistically these back tests work, but you also have to test with real money your system because when you when you when you're actually being tested real time under fire, you're going to get issues possibly like slippage. Uh, a number of things can happen that uh, that that take those back test results and uh, and uh, diminish what you what you saw in the back tests. Um, yeah. Now here's another here's another silly question. You were unloading yesterday, but did not give us any indication that you were that negative on stocks. Hey, I run very concentrated positions, okay? And if they're running up and I see the market starting to get into trouble and I can put a couple of pieces together, I'll bail out and I'll take my profits. And I may have to come back in either higher or later on if the market just ends up pulling back a little bit. But that's the way I run my portfolio and I may run 50 to 100% positions. If you're sitting with a wimpy 10% position and you're willing to give your stock some room, then you can give it, you know, five or six percent. Just because I'm unloading doesn't mean you should be unloading necessarily. And I got to say, I take someone, I, I become somewhat indignant about somebody, uh, you know, after the fact, saying, oh, well, you were unloading and now the market's down and why didn't you tell me yesterday? Well, what if I did and what if the market had turned around and gone up today? Then you'd be whining that we shook you out. You know, that kind of question to me is just utterly silly because Dr. K isn't bailing out. I am. So there's two different sides to this. Dr. K, you want to comment on that? Sure. Well, I don't have any stocks to bail out of, but um, and if I did, I would have, you know, they would have already hit yeah, my sell ETFs, stop. In most and you're cases. still holding the ETFs, correct? If, if, yeah. Oh, yeah. The ETFs are fine because that's a longer term strategy. Everyone's got to define what their what their term is. Some people have intermediate terms. Some people even longer. They got to find what time frame works for their trading personality. Gil's trading personality is is to be out at the drop of a hat. That's not my trading personality. Even if I own stocks, um, and I, this has happened before, where Gil will be out maybe a day in advance or two days in advance, and I need to see a little bit more selling confirmation before my stops are hit. That's just my style. But right. you got to find what more works. positions and smaller position sizes. Yeah, so, and the other thing is, like, I mean, Gil, when, when Gil says wimpy 10%, <laughs> I mean, I think he yeah, really means that tongue-in-cheek because ultimately, ultimately you can have, you know, 15 positions, and, and back in the day, you know, when I was doing triple-digit returns in the late 90s routinely, 
um, I had a lot of wimpy positions, but a lot of positions can make up for a formidable portfolio. So again, you got to find out what percentage works for you, and don't ever let your ego get in the way of oh, well, I want to own more shares and I want a bigger position. And don't right. let you know your ego cannot dictate your position size. If Gil's ego dictated that he wants to do 100 percent, 200 percent, he would have lost money a long time ago because the ego is a, a surefire way to uh, right. to kill your returns. Right, and you have no method for for handling how you trade. In other words, if you're going to choose a certain orientation, so I'm hyper aggressive and I'm looking for decent moves and if I get a decent move in a stock using a hundred percent position, uh, for example I had a hundred and twenty percent position in course, okay? And when I start to see that thing get in trouble yesterday, I'm gone. I'm not I'm not gonna sit and wait for so I can be down twenty percent. I'm gone. I've learned my lesson in terms of running concentrated positions and trying to be stubborn. Now if you've got several positions and let's just take some example. Let's say you got a 10% position here on HLSS and it's pulling back like this. Well, you know, you could say, oh, you know, why didn't you tell me to short sell it yesterday? Well, who knows how far it's going to pull down? And if you bought it down lower, say down in here, you're still pretty well up and you can afford maybe to sit through it. And that's what Dr. K would do. That would be his approach because he's got smaller positions, so less risk, and he gives them more room. I run bigger positions. I'm looking for more upside thrust, and I will sell and take profits into that upside thrust and, and trim my position into something maybe I can hold. But if, if I think the market's in trouble, I run away, and I don't care what Dr. K thinks. If the two of us don't agree at that po exact point in time, then we're not going to run around putting out an email saying that, oh, run, run out of the market no matter what you own and how much you own. So really, a lot of that depends on what your uh, you know entry points are as well. So. Uh, Polaris, uh, this thing's just starting. If it's breaking down, I'd, I'd give it more time. This isn't really getting that ugly yet. I, I think I like Lulu better in terms of these sorts of late stage failed breakouts. But it is, that is what it is right now. So, anyways. Would you consider Cephe's recent action as a handle? No. You know, what do you have here? It's, this is a cup with a handle, but it, you're in a downtrend overall, it looks like to me. So, no. No, John. <laughs> I like this. Somebody's mocking that last question. Gil, will you call me and tell me when to buy the stocks you buy? Then call me and tell me when to sell them. I'm using you as a crutch and need uh -huh. you hold your and need to hold your and need you to hold my hand. Oh no, and need to hold your hand. Insert sarcasm, please. Yeah, I mean that's really the deal. So I love it. Um, anyways, and I got to tell you, there have been the times when I've blown out of the market and Dr. K is sitting tight and he's right and I'm wrong. You know. But that's fine because when I make money, I make a lot of money very quickly, and and I can and I don't want to get in a lot of trouble. So just just our style. CRM. Uh, I think earnings come out someday uh, in the next couple of weeks. I think, but uh, you know, this it's starting to break down. It's closing below the 50-day. So if you are own it from way below down here, then I think you're using the 50-day moving average a violation of it as your selling guide. Okay, so I think that's how you handle that. Anyways, we're getting to nine o'clock. We got a few more minutes here. Somebody says, "Word of advice: Just learn to make your own buy and sell decisions. Write up your own damn trade plan and follow its rules." Exactly. And so I got my trading plan. I follow my rules. Dr. K follows his, and you should follow yours. So I don't have some crystal ball that tells me this is a massive top. And uh, and I think you know I was selling out yesterday when stuff was up in the morning. Something just smelled funny to me, and I, and to me as well. The, the huge breakdown in gold and silver is a clue that something is a little bit disjointed here, and I'm not sure what it is. But my, like I said, I'd rather be out of the market right now, wishing I was in, than the other way around. So, somebody says instead of calling this QE, we should call it as a Titanic. When the credit downgrade comes, you should be off the boat already, sipping on a pina colada, watching the fireworks. Thanks for your guidance. Yeah, I hope to be there too. Uh, let's see. Somebody says they were on, on vacation a week ago on uh, the Turk, the islands, Turks and Ka Kaikos. Is that right? Or Sysos? I, Kaisos? I forget. I read your books on the beach. The first for the second time I have to say since becoming a subscriber to you guys, I've moved up my trading results X 1,000%. The best two trading books. Well, thanks for that. We appreciate that. Um, made 130000 on the course trade. That will pay for your vacation. Well, I think after taxes, but we'll see. But that's good to hear, you know. Um, and I have to say that there are a lot of our subscribers out there who do a hell of a lot better than I do, you know. So, 
anyways, American railroad cars don't like it. Would not. Would probably be selling this big volume reversal. Uh, someone's apologizing. Okay, we accept your apology. I don't. You know, don't. We don't want to get too too emotional here. But I do get that one from time to time. You know, you you sold like. Uh, if you say if I write a report, I write a report twice weekly on another website, and uh, you know I just give my views. So if, if I say you know I sold out yesterday and I wrote a report yesterday, people will get all miffed that I didn't put out some special report. Um, and I just think that that's ignoring the, the reality that you everybody has to trade according to their own psychology and their own methodology and and their own stocks and and their own risk tolerance. So I think. As we see the market come off here, you have to decide how you're going to handle your positions that are showing weakness, and whether you're going to back off and take some profits. And you know, my motto is: when the ducks are quacking, most of the time you want to be feeding the ducks, especially with thinner stocks. And so I'll definitely take profits there and back away. But I'm I'm leery of the market here myself. I've uh, had some short positions. I'm not making any money on the Amazon, which is sitting right about where I shorted a little while ago. The UVXY continues to go higher. Uh, Alexion is coming in. Uh, ALGN line is uh, you know trying to hold here just below the 200-day moving average, but I think it's it'll break if the market breaks. But I think you got a tight stop here. Anyways, I think that's all I have, Dr. K. Do you have anything uh, else to add here? No, I think we're good. Just got to watch this market like a hawk uh, as we get closer to an impending switch uh, switch of signal. All right, and those of you who are thanking us for a great webinar, uh, you're welcome. Um, uh, I didn't notice it was all that great, but if you guys think so, we're more than happy to uh, take that uh, compliment, and we thank you for that. Anyways, uh, good luck, you guys. I think you you do need to watch your watch your butts here and uh, be cautious, and don't let your stocks get in too much trouble. Uh, and we'll see where we go. But you know, to the extent that we can guide you on our email reports, we will do so. And I've given you some short sale ideas, but remember, we're only two days off the peak, so it's it's kind of early. If sometimes if you get lucky, you can short some things right off the peak. And it, it that can be profitable, but what happens is you'll come down for a few days, and then you have a sharp rally. When that happens, being short is not fun. So if you do start making some money on the short side, don't be a pig. Understand where you you have the potential to undercut prior lows, or find prior support in a pattern and potentially rally. So remember, bulls make money, bears make money, and pigs get chopped up into little pieces and turned into bako bits. All right, we'll talk to you guys later. Take care, and thanks for showing up as always. So long, everyone. <laughs>